So here's what I wanted in a camper. Needed to be capable of towing a trailer up to 5,000 pounds, able to serve as living quarters for one or two people while dry camping or boondocking up to 10 days, able to operate on dirt roads and across farm fields while towing a 2,000 pound enclosed glider trailer in order to retrieve sailplanes that may have landed off airport. And it also needed to be reasonably fuel efficient, easy to service, and able to park in most places. So right off the bat, I knew I needed a either a truck camper or a four-wheel drive van. And I, I really thought a van might be the best solution for a while. But I found out they're really expensive and difficult to get with a long waiting time and ultimately their off-road ability and towing capacity is almost never as good as a truck. So I stuck with the truck and tried to figure out what kind of camper I could put on it that would meet the other requirements other than towing and off-road. In other words, had to be livable. When I saw the ad for this four-wheel drive Silverado with a winch on the front, I figured this is the kind of thing that's never going to get stuck. It took a lot of work to get the used truck into shape, and my mechanic said that having that 300 pounds of winch and support bracket hanging off the front bumper had destroyed the front suspension over the course of 14 years, so I took it off until I knew I was going to need it. I found this Lear Topper on Craigslist. It was only $600, but it needed screens, insulation, and new lift struts. It was really good at keeping stuff in the back of the truck dry, but wasn't that much room underneath. I built a raised plywood platform for the back of the truck that was friction fit and easily removable. It gave me a place to put some milk crates underneath with camping storage. I used the topper for camping for short things, you know, up to four, four days. And uh, it worked okay, but usually I had to have a tent to keep some stuff in. There just wasn't enough room in the camper. And when it was cold, it was not very pleasant. But the thing I really didn't like was the fact that I couldn't stand up inside the topper. I looked at purchasing a Chevy Express van and having it converted to four-wheel drive by Quigley. Between the build and the conversion, it would have taken about 14 to 16 months. I also looked at getting a Sprinter van or a Ram van, but none of those really seemed to have the towing capacity or the off-road capability that I was looking for. And by this time, I had put a lot of money into getting the truck into really good shape. I also looked at a lot of truck campers, but they were a little bit too heavy for my three-quarter ton truck. And I still wanted to have that towing capacity for up to 5,000 pounds. In early 2021, I saw that a couple of companies had started to make camper shells that fit on the bed rails of the truck rather than sliding in like a truck camper. In June 2021, I decided to get a pop-up truck camper shell that mounted on the bed rails rather than sliding in. It was super lightweight and would allow me to still tow 5,000 pounds and carry lots of stuff and not overload my truck. I removed the Lear shell and gave it to my brother to put on his 92 Chevy pickup. I had a little bit of email correspondence with Jay and Maggie Wellman of Overland Campers in Flagstaff, Arizona. When I talked to Jay on the phone, he said he could deliver a custom fit camper in seven months. So I placed my order. Getting a custom built camper that fit the truck properly required making careful measurements. Ultimately, my measurements matched those Jay had used for another Silverado camper build. While waiting for the camper to be built, I watched a lot of YouTube videos on what other people had done in their camper builds. I ordered some used lithium iron phosphate cells on AliExpress and assembled a 280 amp hour battery. And I put in a smart relay to charge the battery from the alternator of the truck. One of the things I wanted was to be able to get from the cab to the camper without going outside. So I got a sliding rear window to replace the fixed window in the back of the cab. I continued my correspondence with Jay and Maggie and was able to make some adjustments before they actually started the build. Jay and Maggie let me know the progress of the build and turned out that the camper would be ready before the Christmas holidays. But I decided to wait until January to drive out to Flagstaff and have them install it. 
I had never driven out west from Florida, and I enjoyed seeing the topography and weather change during the seven days it took to get to Flagstaff. I arrived at Flagstaff late on a Thursday afternoon. Flagstaff is a really beautiful mountaintop college town, and I enjoyed seeing the snow piled up alongside the roads, very different than Florida. I got to the Overland shop first thing Friday morning for the installation, and I was really, really impressed by the quality of the build. The aluminum welding and the rivet spacing, everything was perfect. The approach that Overland takes on their campers is to give you a basic shell with the accessories that you want on the exterior skin, and then let you finish the interior the way that you want. It makes the manufacturing much simpler, and you can use the camper for a while before deciding what you need on the interior. Six guys carefully lifted the camper and set it on the rails of the truck. Placement was fine-tuned, and then it was clamped to the bed rails of my truck. The fit was perfect. Once the camper was on the truck, Matt showed me how to raise and lower the roof, work the latches, and make sure that the clamps were properly tightened. We also reviewed various maintenance and repair procedures for the camper. After a visit to the Home Depot to purchase some insulation, I spent the rest of the day friction fitting one inch polystyrene insulation between the framing of the camper. I wanted to get it insulated before I spent the night in the camper in January in Arizona. After I got the camper mostly insulated, I headed south to Quartzsite. Turned out that I was able to attend Bob Wells' Rubber Tramp Rendezvous, and I, sp I spent about five days at the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous in Quartzsite, and attended lots of free seminars on camping etiquette, camping cooking, maintenance of your camper, camping gear, and all sorts of other useful information for long-term camping. During the 2,500-mile journey back home, I put into practice some of the things that I learned at the RTR. I enjoyed the trip and got to see parts of America I had never seen before. During the time I was gone, full-time RVer Michelle was kind enough to man the fort for me, parking my pop-up camper next to her slide-in truck camper mounted on a Ford 350 Super Duty shows the difference in size. I did a couple of sketches and began building the interior right away. I wanted to get as much done as I could for the Sun and Fun Air Show at Lakeland, Florida in April. I didn't want to attach interior components to the truck bed or to the camper frame any more than was necessary, so I started off with a heavy plywood foundation that everything could rest on. The camper came with a really nice insulated composite sleeping platform, but it didn't have a mattress. I wanted something that fit well and could be left in place more or less all the time. The challenge was the mattress had to be no more than about four inches total thickness for the top to close properly. My friend Dick Miller, a hot air balloon pilot, owns an upholstery supply company in Florida called Reliatex, and he helped me get the perfect foam and fabric. I got the sewing supplies from a company called Sailrite, and I did all the sewing myself. I wanted to be able to wipe down all the woodwork with a mild bleach solution in case of any mold, so I covered all the woodwork with 6 ounce fiberglass cloth and epoxy. Attaching components to the roof structure was a challenge. I used a small brake to bend some aluminum into pans that fit between the roof ribs. I purchased a small DC refrigerator and water jugs and began fine tuning how everything was going to fit in a very small space with obstacles like the wheel wells. I had to make sure I could still get to the clamps that held the shell onto the bed rails. After lots of trial and error, everything worked out. I put in some dimmable LED strip lights on the ceiling for general illumination. I have two warm white strips and one red strip that I use to maintain my night vision when I'm camping in dark places. A major milestone was beginning the service bay and sink counter framing. I had to install a bunch of riv nuts into the camper frame to provide some lateral support, but all the weight is really borne on the floor. I also began covering all the insulation on the walls. I used 3 8 inch plywood in most areas and then a 16 inch PVC covering for areas higher up and the hatches. I really tried to keep the total weight down. I used thinner plywood where possible and covered it with fiberglass and epoxy to reduce the chance of warping in high humidity conditions. 
I had to do the sink counter so that I could still extend the bed platform all the way out, but when it was retracted I would have a little more counter space. The sink drains into a 5 gallon collapsible water container, and I have two of them in case one fills up. And I can also extend the hose out the back if I'm really in a remote area. So I have to say something about tools. A lot of this work required tools that I already had. I happen to have a router and that allowed me to do plastic laminate finish on the sink counter. I did end up buying quite a number of electrical tools and some other tools. And if you don't have the tools, you really may not want to build out the interior of a camper. I wanted the ability to get water from less than perfect sources when I was boondocking. So I needed a pressurized system to push water through a cartridge filter. I found I had just enough space in front of the wheel well to install the pump and a 5 inch cartridge filter. One unique thing about my water system is I have a UV sterilizer. It has LED UV lights and it kills bacteria and other pathogens that most water filters can't remove. Finding a readily accessible place for a fire extinguisher was a challenge. One guest complained that the floor was a little bit bouncy, so I added unidirectional carbon fiber tapes to stiffen it. Even when the camper looked like it was mostly finished, there were still lots left to do. The electrical system began to get more complex, and I hadn't even started on the solar. I did a test fit of the diesel heater. I wanted to make sure that it fit in the same space that I was going to put the air conditioner in. I changed the design to allow for more storage space around the heater. Installing the air conditioner turned out to be pretty easy. The air conditioner makes a huge difference in summer. It'll run for an hour or two off the battery, but really it's primarily usable when I'm connected to shore power or I'm on a generator. The hardest thing about installing the solar panels was building a strong frame to link all three panels together. I considered designing a tilt mechanism, but I finally realized I could achieve some of the angled exposure just by tilting the roof. Keeping the weight on the roof to a minimum was critical. I installed a combination smoke and carbon monoxide detector before I installed the diesel heater. I did everything possible to make sure that the diesel heater installation would be safe. I was concerned about the hot exhaust around the wood, so I built a metal liner and covered it in mineral fiber insulation. I did what I could to reduce the ticking sound from the heater fuel pump. I had already had a problem with high voltage from the solar charger damaging electronic circuitry, so I put in a voltage regulator ahead of the diesel heater control panel. It finally felt like I was nearing the finish line. I added a positive bus bar, some disconnects and fuses, and a battery monitoring system. Some final details included collapsible storage bins, installation of some radio antennas, and mounting a tire inflator and tool kit to the floor ahead of the milk crate storage system. Happily, I got everything done with a couple weeks to spare before the Chilhowee Glider Port Oktoberfest in Tennessee. I was surprised to encounter 26 degree Fahrenheit weather in northern Florida and more cold weather in Georgia and, of course, in the mountains of Tennessee. I had one minor glitch with the diesel heater that I was able to fix in about 15 minutes, and I had a failure of the inverter, which I still haven't figured out, but I had a really great three-week-long trip, and the camper was everything I hoped it would be. I still have to try towing stuff with it, though.